ABC News Live. I hope is for you is that you are miserable for the rest of your pathetic life. Emotional moments in the courtroom as the Parkland school shooter is confronted by parents of the victims. The judge has sentenced him to life in prison, but there is outrage from families who believe he deserved the death penalty. New details in the attack on Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband. Sources say Capitol Police cameras captured the home invasion, but no one was monitoring the feed when they realized something was wrong. And with that violence in mind in less than a week until Election Day, a speech from President Biden tonight on what he calls the challenges facing our democracy right now. Also speaking out against divisive and dangerous political rhetoric, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. People broke into the Capitol with cries to hang the Speaker of the House, to kill the Vice President of the United States, and there is not unanimous condemnation of that event. He speaks with our Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas about violent extremism and the impact it's having on midterm elections. More than 20 missile tests launched in a major escalation from North Korea. One of the projectiles landed just 35 miles off South Korea's coast, leading the country to deliver a strong response. Matt Gutman has the latest from Seoul. He's one of the greatest musicians to ever live, known for his iconic voice and standout trumpet skills. But how much do we really know about Louis Armstrong? A new documentary shines a light on the extraordinary man behind the music. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. You know the countdown well by now, just six days until the midterm election. And as voters are already heading to the polls for early voting, tonight the Secretary of Homeland Security is among the latest to raise alarm about political violence in the days after Paul Pelosi, the husband of the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, was brutally attacked inside his home. According to investigators, the suspect believed in conspiracy theories, and they say the attack was politically motivated. At any minute, President Biden is expected to address the country and warn of a path to chaos that could come if candidates do not accept the results of the election. This comes as we are learning from court documents that the suspect told investigators he was on a suicide mission and had plans to target other California and federal politicians. This is exactly the type of attack officials that officials have been concerned about in this divisive political environment. And we're going to interrupt right now to send you right live to President Biden. A man smashed the back windows and broke into the home of the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the third highest ranking official in America. He carried in his backpack zip ties, duct tape, rope, and a hammer. As he told the police, he had come looking for Nancy Pelosi to take her hostage, to interrogate her, to threaten to break her kneecaps. But she wasn't there. Her husband, my friend Paul Pelosi, was home alone. The assailant tried to take Paul hostage. He woke him up. He wanted to tie him up. The assailant ended up using a hammer to smash Paul's skull. Thankfully, by the grace of God, Paul survived. All this happened after the assault and it just, I, it's hard to even say. It's hard to even say. After the assailant entered the home asking, <clears throat> where's Nancy? Where's Nancy? Those are the very same words used by the mob when they stormed the United States Capitol on January the 6th, when they broke windows, kicked in the doors, brutally attacked law enforcement, roamed the corridors, hunting, hunting for officials and erected gallows to hang the former Vice President, Mike Pence. It was an enraged mob that had been whipped up into a frenzy by a president repeating over and over again the big lie that the election of 2020 had been stolen. It's a lie that fueled the dangerous rise in political violence and voter intimidation over the past two years. Even before January the 6th, we saw election officials and election workers in a number of states subject to menacing calls, physical threats, even threats to their very lives. In Georgia, for example, 
Republican Secretary of State and his family were subjected to death threats because he refused to break the law and give in to the defeated president's demand, just find him 11,780 votes. Just find me 11,780 votes. Election workers like Shea Moss and her mother, Ruby Freeman, were harassed and threatened just because they had the courage to do their job and stand up for the truth, to stand up for our democracy. This institution, this intimidation, this violence against Democrats, Republicans, and nonpartisan officials just doing their jobs are the consequence of lies told for power and profit, lies of conspiracy and malice, lies repeated over and over to generate a cycle of anger, hate, vitriol, and even violence. In this moment, we have to confront those lies with the truth. The very future of our nation depends on it. My fellow Americans, we're facing a defining moment, an inflection point. We must, with one overwhelming, unified voice, speak as a country and say there's no place, no place for voter intimidation or political violence in America, whether it's directed at Democrats or Republicans. No place, period. No place ever. I speak today near Capitol Hill, near the U.S. Capitol, the citadel of our democracy. I know there's a lot at stake in these midterm elections, from our economy to the safety of our streets to our personal freedoms, the future of health care, Social Security, Medicare. It's all important. But we'll have our differences. We'll have our difference of opinion. And that's what it's supposed to be. But there's something else at stake. Democracy itself. I'm not the only one who sees it. Recent polls have shown that overwhelming majority of Americans believe our democracy at ri is at risk, that our democracy is under threat. They, too, see that democracy is on the ballot this year, and they're deeply concerned about it. So today, I appeal to all Americans, regardless of party, to meet this moment of national and generational importance. We must vote knowing what's at stake and not just the policy of the moment, but institutions that have held us together as we sought a more perfect union are also at stake. We must vote knowing who we have been, what we're at risk of becoming. Look, my fellow Americans, the old expression, freedom is not free. It requires constant vigilance. From the very beginning, Nothing has been guaranteed about democracy in America. Every generation has had to defend it, protect it, preserve it, choose it. For that's what democracy is. It's a choice, a decision of the people, by the people, and for the people. The issue couldn't be clearer, in my view. We, the people, must decide whether we'll have fair and free elections and every vote counts. We, the people, must decide whether we're going to sustain a republic where reality is accepted, the law is obeyed, and your vote is truly sacred. We, the people, must decide whether the rule of law will prevail, whether we'll allow the dark forces to thirst, that thirst for power put ahead of the principles that we've long guided us. You know, American democracy is under attack because the defeated former president of the United States refuses to accept the results of the 2020 election. He refuses to accept the will of the people. He refuses to accept the fact that he lost. He has abused his power and put the loyalty to himself before loyalty to the Constitution. And he's made a big lie, an article of faith in the MAGA Republican Party, the minority of that party. The great irony about the 220 election is that it's the most attacked election in our history. And yet, and yet, 
There's no election in our history that we can be more certain of its results. Every legal challenge that could have been brought was brought. Every recount that could have been undertaken was undertaken. Every recount confirmed the results. Wherever fact or evidence had been demanded, the big lie has been proven to be just that, a big lie, every single time. Yet now, extreme MAGA Republicans aim to question not only the legitimacy of past elections, but elections being held now and into the future. The extreme MAGA element of the Republican Party, which is a minority of that party, as I said earlier, but it's this driving force. It's trying to succeed where they failed in 2020, to suppress the right of voters and subvert the electoral system itself. That means denying your right to vote and deciding whether your vote even counts. Instead of waiting until an election is over, they're starting well before it. They're starting now. They've emboldened violence and intimidation of voters and election officials. It's estimated that there are more than 300 election deniers on the ballot all across America this year. We can't ignore the impact this is having on our country. It's damaging, it's corrosive, and it's destructive. And I want to be very clear, this is not about me. It's about all of us. It's about what makes America, America. It's about the durability of our democracy. For democracies are more than a form of government. They're a way of being, a way of seeing the world, a way that defines who we are, what we believe, why we do what we do. Democracy is simply that fundamental. We must, in this moment, dig deep within ourselves and recognize that we can't take democracy for granted any longer. With democracy on the ballot, we have to remember these first principles. Democracy means the rule of the people, not the rule of monarchs or the moneyed, but the rule of the people. Autocracy is the opposite of democracy. It means the rule of one. One person, one interest, one ideology, one party. To state the obvious, the lives of billions of people from antiquity till now have been shaped by the battle between these competing forces, between the aspirations of the many and the greed and power of the few, between the people's right for self-determination and the self-seeking autocrat between the dreams of a democracy and the appetites of an autocracy. What we're doing now is going to determine whether democracy will long endure. It, in my view, is the biggest of questions. Whether the American system that prizes the individual, bends towards justice, and depends, depends on the rule of law, whether that system will prevail. This is the struggle we're now in a struggle for democracy, a struggle for decency and dignity, a struggle for prosperity and progress, a struggle for the very soul of America itself. Make no mistake, democracy is in the ballot for all of us. We must remember that democracy is a covenant. We need to start looking out for each other again, seeing ourselves as we, the people, not as entrenched enemies. This is a choice we can make. Disunion and chaos are not inevitable. There's been anger before in America. There's been division before in America. But we've never given up on the American experiment. And we can't do that now. The remarkable thing about American democracy is this. Just enough of us on just enough occasions have chosen not to dismantle democracy, but to preserve democracy. We must choose that path again. Because democracy is in the ballot, we have to remember 
that even in our darkest moments, there are fundamental values and beliefs that unite us as Americans. And they must unite us now. What are they? Well, I think first, we believe the vote in America is sacred, to be honored, not denied, respected, not dismissed, counted, not ignored. A vote is not a partisan tool to be counted when it helps your candidates and tossed aside when it doesn't. Second, we must, with an overwhelming voice, stand against political violence and voter intimidation, period. Stand up and speak against it. We don't settle our differences in America with a riot, a mob, or a bullet, or a hammer. We settle them peacefully at the battle, at the battle box, the ballot box. We have to be honest with ourselves, though. We have to face this problem. We can't turn away from it. We can't pretend it's just going to solve itself. There's an alarming rise in the number of our people in this country condoning political violence or simply remaining silent because silence is complicity. The disturbing rise of voter intimidation, the pernicious tendency to excuse political violence, or at least, at least trying to explain it away. We can't allow this sentiment to grow. We must confront it head on now. It has to stop now. I believe the voices excusing or calling for violence and intimidation are a distinct minority in America. But they're loud and they are determined. We have to be more determined. All of us who reject political violence and voter intimidation and I believe that's the overwhelming majority of the American people. All of us must unite to make it absolutely clear that violence and intimidation have no place in America. And third, we believe in democracy. That's who we are as Americans. I know it isn't easy. Democracy is imperfect. It always has been. But we're all called to defend it now, now. History and common sense tell us that liberty, <clears throat> opportunity, and justice thrive in a democracy, not in an autocracy. At our best, America is not a zero-sum society where for you to succeed, someone else has to fail. The promise of America is big enough. It's big enough for everyone to succeed. Every generation opened in the door of opportunity just a little bit wider. Every generation, including those who have been excluded before. We believe we should leave no one behind because each one of us is a child of God. And every person, every person is sacred. If that's true, then every person's rights must be sacred as well. Individual dignity individual worth, individual determination. That's America. That's democracy. And that's what we have to defend. Look, even as I speak here tonight, 27 million people have already cast their ballot in the midterm elections. Millions more will cast their ballots in the final days leading up to November the 9th, 8th, excuse me. And for the first time, this is the first time since the national election of 2020. Once again, we're seeing record turnout all over the country. And that's good. We want Americans to vote. We want every American's voice to be heard. Now we have to move the process forward. We know that more and more ballots are cast in early voting or by mail in America. And we know that many states don't start counting those ballots until after the polls close on November 8th. That means in some cases, we won't know the winner of the election for a few days, until a few days after the election. It takes time to count all legitimate ballots in a legal and orderly manner. It's always been important for citizens in democracy to be informed and engaged. Now it's important for citizens to be patient as well. That's how it's supposed to work. 
This is also the first election since the events of January 6th, when the armed, angry mob stormed the U.S. Capitol. I wish, I wish I could say the assault on a democracy had ended that day, but I cannot. As I stand here today, there are candidates running for every level of office in America, for governor, Congress, Attorney General, Secretary of State, who won't commit, they will not commit to accepting the results of elections that they're running in. This is a path to chaos in America. It's unprecedented. It's unlawful. And it's un-American. As I've said before, you can't love your country only when you win. This is no ordinary year. So I ask you to think long and hard about the moment we're in. In a typical year, we're often not faced with questions of whether the vote we cast will preserve democracy or put us at risk. But this year, we are. This year, I hope you'll make the future of our democracy an important part of your decision to vote and how you vote. I hope you'll ask a simple question of each candidate you might vote for. Will that person accept the legitimate will of the American people, of the people voting in his district or her district? Will that person accept the outcome of the election, win or lose? The answer to that question is vital. And in my opinion, it should be decisive. And the answer to that question hangs the future of the country we love so much and the fate of the democracy that has made so much possible for us. Too many people have sacrificed too much for too many years for us to walk away from the American project and democracy. Because we've enjoyed our freedoms for so long, it's easy to think they'll always be with us no matter what. But that isn't true today. In our bones, we know democracy at risk is at risk. But we also know this. It's within our power, each and every one of us, to preserve our democracy. And I believe we will. I think I know this country. I know we will. You have the power. It's your choice. It's your decision. The fate of the nation, the fate of the soul of America lies where it always does, with the people, in your hands, in your heart, in your ballot. My fellow Americans, we'll meet this moment. We just need to remember who we are. We are the United States of America. There's nothing, nothing beyond our capacity if we do it together. May God bless you all. May God protect our troops. May God bless those standing guard over our democracy. Thank you, and Godspeed. President Biden addressing the nation on threats to democracy, saying democracy is on the ballot, saying American democracy is now on under attack because the former president refused to accept the will of the people and refused to accept uh, that he lost the election. First, he started out detailing uh, the attack on Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House husband, Paul Pelosi, in their home a few days ago in San Francisco. He then detailed uh, threats and rhetoric on both sides of the aisle, people uh, being uh, attacked and, and suggesting uh, that, that intimidation is now uh, too prevalent uh, across the country. I uh, want to turn to, to Terry Moran, uh, who joins us now. Uh, Terry, uh, curious to, to get your reaction to this speech. Again, the president calling this a defining moment, uh, attempting to rem rem remind us as Americans uh, who we are, and this is about the will of the American people. It was an extraordinary political speech. He's at a political event. This is Joe Biden's closing argument that democracy itself is at stake, that this is an election, as he put it, uh, that will determine what we are at risk of becoming. He sees a shadow crossing the land. And it reminded me of essentially what was his opening argument for the presidency after uh, Charlottesville and the white supremacists marching there and killing someone uh, uh, by ramming uh, in a car into a crowd. He said this was, that election was a battle for the soul of America. And what he was saying tonight is that it's not over. 
uh, and he noted the number of people of Republican candidates, hundreds, by one estimate, more than half of all Republican candidates who do not accept the legitimacy of the 2020 presidential election, uh, despite that it was confirmed by each of the 50 sovereign states uh, and confirmed against charges of fraud by 60 courts of law. They just won't have it. Uh, and President Biden did say something that struck me. He said we must confront the lies with truth. The problem is, and I've been out on the road the past couple of weeks talking to a lot of voters and a lot of candidates who are denying, don't trust the elections anymore. We don't share the same truth about our elections at all anymore, about many things, but certainly not about how we vote. And that makes voting very, very dangerous. Terry, uh, curious, did you get the sense, uh, he, he seemed to be really tempering expectations, uh, talking about how, look, in order to count every ballot, it takes time, that, that we won't necessarily know the outcome on the 8th. That's right, and there are candidates out there, I heard one say, you know, we should be able to know the result of an election on election night. Well, we didn't know the result of an election on election night until, you know, really the past couple of generations. And there are times even in, that, in those days, the 2000 election and other elections before 2020, when Americans had to wait a little while to the wee hours of the morning or even several weeks later. And the republic stood, did just fine. They counted every vote. That's always been the priority. But now there is such a distrust and such, frankly, an ignorance of how votes are counted and of what the work of these election officials, many of whom are getting death threats all the time. I talked to a county clerk in Colorado who wears a bulletproof vest to work every day and changes his commute on the advice of the sheriff and of the Department of Homeland Security. And because of that, because people are so, they lack the facts of how the votes are counted and they are being, their minds are being filled with the poison that their votes are being stolen that they are willing to be violent. And, and I think one of the things you see is that the president says, democracy will happen. Just let it happen. Trust your neighbors who are the people who are in the precincts. Trust the people that you elected to count the votes. But even there, I talked to a, a woman in Michigan. I said, do you trust uh, the elections in Michigan? She says, no, not until we're, not until our people are running them. Secretary of State, governor, attorney general. She'll only trust the elections when Republicans win. Mm, very interesting. That bulletproof vest really says it all. Terry, uh, our thanks to you. And now I'd like to bring in our ABC News political director, Mr. Rick Klein. It, Rick, I want to actually pick up on Terry's last point there. Uh, the idea that we do have so many election deniers who are running, in many cases, for the Secretary of State. What is at stake here? It's undeniable. And, and beyond the hundreds who are running, I think to focus on people who might actually run the next election, who say falsely that the last election was stolen, they could be in charge of running the machinery of an election as a governor, as a secretary of state, as an attorney general. And, and we're talking about people who very well could win next week, not just in safe red seats or, or safe blue states, but in some of the most contested battlegrounds in the country, places like Nevada, like Arizona, where people up and down the ticket, Carrie Lake, the gubernatorial candidate, been outspoken in saying that she does not believe the last election should have been certified. Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, where the gubernatorial candidate gets to name the next secretary of state. These are people that might be in a position to actually do what Donald Trump demanded get done last time around. They are on the ballot. Uh, right now, people are voting for them, sometimes in the millions, as the, as the president just noted. And for him now, the president now, to come back to this messaging, I think is trying to, to underscore those stakes. He says this is no ordinary year. This is no ordinary political message messaging, Lindsay, either. And especially when you have some people who sound like if they don't win, then they're going to say it, it wasn't a, a free or a fair election. want to just take a step back and look at the, the context of the timing of yeah. this speech. Is this just a political speech or is this really, do you think, something that might have the potential to getting to Americans beyond the partisan politics? It is a political speech, but it's also not just a political speech. And this is what I mean. The president's been saying this for a long time, and he's not wrong in making this point. He talked right around Labor Day uh, about ultra MAGA Republicans at Independence Hall, making very much the same argument. It is only more tangible, more relevant now. He acknowledged that the crises that many people feel in their lives right now are things like inflation, gas prices, health care. 
Those are the things that people seem to be caring about a little bit more than the, the harder to understand states of democracy. Um, but at the same time, where it's not a political speech is that it really is about the future of, of, of whether elections can happen. Because if you have people who will not commit to uh, respecting the rule of law, respecting free and fair elections, Lindsay, there's, a, you know, there, there, there are individuals, probably a half dozen or so, people that went to the January 6th rally who are now trying to come back to Washington as members of Congress. Some of them could win right. next week. Same deal with some, uh, some statewide candidates. That's an astounding fact. And I think the, the president tried to connect a lot of dots for people. Whether it changes minds, this has been a very hard message to get people to, vote us, to focus on amid so much else going on in their lives. I, we just watched in, in Brazil, Bolsonaro, many people had speculated that he wasn't going to accept the results if he lost. We saw that he now is moving forward with the transition. So we will be there on Tuesday Tuesday uh, to watch it all play out uh, right alongside with your work in the big boards. So we thank you so much for your analysis Thanks, as always, Rick. Now we move to the economy and the latest move by the Federal Reserve to try to slow down inflation. The Fed today raised its key interest rate three quarters of a point. That's the sixth increase this year and increases the cost of borrowing for Americans as the Fed hopes to try to cool off the economy without sending it into a painful recession. And of course, the economy and inflation are top of mind for voters just days before the critical midterm elections. That's especially true in states like Nevada, which could help determine which party controls the Senate. ABC's Martha Raddatz was recently on the ground there speaking to voters and has the very latest. She's the nation's first Latina senator and she's fighting for political survival. So overnight, former President Obama in Nevada rallying with Catherine Cortez Masto, urging supporters not to give up the fight. Tuning out is not an option. Moping and feeling cynical is not an option. Cortez Masto battling low name recognition in a state that's seen large numbers of voters move in and move out. Inflation here now above the national average. Gas prices, the fifth highest in the country. Tourism, the backbone of the economy, grinding to a halt during the pandemic. Cortez Masto now counting on a volunteer army. Workers from the powerful culinary union going door to door to get out the vote. Her rival, former state attorney general Adam Laxalt, a Trump Republican who spearheaded the former president's efforts to overturn the election results in this state. If he loses this election to me, he's claiming it's stolen. But in the final stretch, Laxalt focusing on the economy, saying voters are hurting. They can't believe that Joe Biden and Kathy Cortez Masto have done this much damage to our great country and to our great state in just two short years. And for Nevadans we spoke with, the economy is the number one issue. Inflation, that's a big issue with you. Why? Because the prices have gone so high. You know, and... and I live on Social Security. I'm 79. It, it's not keeping up with it. That is, of course, what Republicans are trying to focus on, the economy. But the Democrats, Catherine Cortez Masto, is trying to convince her constituents that the Democrats can turn it around. Lindsay? Martha, thank you. Next Tuesday, ABC News is your home for midterm election coverage. We have live coverage on ABC News Live all morning throughout the day and beginning at 8 p.m. Eastern. I'll join David Muir and our powerhouse political team on ABC to bring you election results as they come in on this very critical night and the subsequent days ahead, if need be. Now to the war in Ukraine. Ukrainian forces have been closing in on the strategic city of Kherson to the south. ABC's foreign correspondent James Longman was with their forces and has this report. The battle for Kherson is intensifying. Ukrainians today claiming hits on this bridge in the southern city. This is the road to Kherson. It's the biggest city that Russia has in its control in this whole country, and it's the only regional capital. And the guys here were saying that just a few weeks ago, this was the very front line of their fight with the Russians, but now they've managed to push them back. They're now closing in on the city, hoping to deal Putin a humiliating blow, but it's taken its toll. For the people fighting here, it's meant months, months without seeing their families. We're far away from our homes, he says, but we're close to the homes of those people who we helped return. It's our people. Mm -hmm. It's your people. It's our country. They're advancing here with US-provided heavy weapons. Yeah, we're hearing more and more activity now. 
all around us. It's just, it's constant. Going out, going out, going out, and some of it coming back. I think we should move. And technology is making the difference. The Ukrainians have gone digital. He has this device here, and with help from the United States and others, you can use satellites now to get the coordinates, and they can aim and fire much more quickly. With the sound of war all around him, Leonid smiles from his front porch, battered just last night by a shell that landed on his neighbor's house. I mean, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Seven months of this war, and yet, basically, everywhere you go in Ukraine, you, you meet people like Leonid who say, well, I'm not leaving. Yeah. This is my home, he says. This is my place. I will not give it to anyone. He has no intention of leaving. James Longman joins us now. James, where do Russians stand at the moment in, in terms of their defense of Kherson? Well, at the moment, we're hearing they're forcibly evacuating thousands of people. Uh, we heard just in the last week an extra 70,000 people moved out of the city over uh, onto the bank of the river, which uh, the Russians control fully, in which they can be satisfied that they can continue to control. Uh, the Ukrainians are saying that this is because this is kind of some kind of false flag set up by the Russians. The Russians are kind of casting themselves as the great protectors of Kherson, and they're saying, look, the Ukrainians are about to attack. They're going to hit this hydroelectric dam. They may flood the area. We've heard these uh, reports about a dirty bomb, possibly. All of this is Russia trying to tell the world we are the ones protecting Kherson. The Ukrainians are saying, don't fall for it. The Russians uh, may well uh, set up false flag attacks inside that city. Look, the, the, the situation is this. We're very, very unclear as to what is actually happening in the city at the moment, but I did speak to an activist who's been there working as a resistance, a member of the civilian resistance, and he's told me that he's seen Russian troops on the streets preparing fortifications. The Ukrainians want to take Kherson back. It's just they've got to work out how. Lindsay. So unsettling. James Longman, our thanks to you. Still ahead here on Prime, the backlash over the, how the NBA and the Brooklyn Nets are treating Kyrie Irving after he posted a film characterized as anti-Semitic. Inflation may be high, but retailers are throwing out more deals with Black Friday looming. But the question is, should we buy now or wait until we get closer to the holidays? And the shift in abortion in red states that just might surprise you. We take a look by the numbers, but first, our tweet of the day, New York City honors actress Lena Horne. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the music. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. 
This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, everyone. With the decision to overturn Roe versus Wade has come an uptick in the use of an alternative to an abortion procedure. We're taking a look at the growing demand for abortion pills by the numbers. There was an average of 83 requests per day for abortion pills before the Supreme Court's draft decision was leaked to the public back in May. That's according to a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association. After the leak, 137 requests a day on average were received for abortion pills. And by June, there were 214 requests on average. That's also of the month when the court released its formal decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. 62% of patients who requested abortion pills after the court's decision cited current abortion restrictions as their reasons, as compared to the 31% before the leak. As the use of pills goes up, the number of legal abortions is also dropping. It fell by about 7,000 a month in July and August in states that banned or restricted nearly all abortions. And the number of people seeking those procedures dropped by 3,000 in states with limited restrictions. Researchers found that Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama, and Oklahoma are seeing the biggest increases in requests for abortion pills. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The millions being paid by CBS and its former chief executive, Les Moonves, as a result of some disturbing allegations. And the Mississippi River is at historically low levels, and this isn't just a climate change issue. It's also a holiday shopping one. We'll explain. But first, to look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. New revelations days after attempted murder suspect David DePap allegedly smashed his way into House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's San Francisco home 
searching for her, but instead finding her husband, Paul, and allegedly bashing him in the head with a hammer. Sources familiar with the matter telling ABC News, U.S. Capitol Police had working cameras outside the Pelosi's home, but nobody was watching them at the time of the attack. Those sources adding Capitol Police later noticed local police lights on a camera, rewound the video, and spotted the break-in. The speaker was in D.C. during the assault, and apparently the cameras are not monitored 24-7 when she's out of town. ABC News also learning the speaker's home private security system designed to notify local and Capitol Police when triggered never sent an alert to Capitol Police. Police in Houston are asking for the public's help in identifying the individual or individuals who opened fire outside a bowling alley early Tuesday morning, killing rapper Takeoff, a member of the Grammy-nominated group Migos. The 28-year-old Takeoff, whose real name is Kirschnick Ball, was attending a private event in downtown Houston. As the party ended around 2.30 a.m., witnesses say gunfire erupted. Video obtained by TMZ shows the argument that preceded the shooting, followed by the sound of gun on fire and people running. Takeoff was fatally shot. Investigators believe at least two firearms were involved, suggesting the possibility of more than one shooter. Court documents filed by the New York Attorney General's office say CBS and former Chief Executive Les Moonves have reached a nearly $10 million settlement stemming from the sexual misconduct allegations that led to Moonves being fired in 2018. Shareholders filed a lawsuit alleging former executives made false statements or failed to disclose material information on the company's handling of workplace sexual harassment complaints. CBS agreed to pay $15 million to shareholders in that suit. A change may be coming to the leadership of the NFL's Washington Commanders. The team announced that embattled owner Dan Snyder and his wife Tanya have hired Bank of America Securities to explore potential transactions. The announcement comes amid numerous calls for Snyder to step away following multiple investigations and allegations surrounding workplace culture and sexual harassment. The NFL fined the team $10 million last year after an investigation reported an unprofessional workplace especially for women, and investigations into claims of sexual harassment made against Snyder. Fallout continues over Brooklyn Nets star Kyrie Irving tweeting out a link to a film that included anti-Semitic tropes late last week. Irving has not been punished by the Nets or the NBA. Even after defending his tweet, Nets general manager Sean Marks said the team was, quote, having discussions about what to do with Irving and were in touch with the Anti-Defamation League. Meanwhile, the NBA received criticism from panelists on TNT's Inside the NBA for not punishing Irving. I think the NBA, they made a mistake. We have suspended people and fined people who have made homophobic slurs, uh, and that, that was the right thing to do. I think if you insult the, uh, the black community, you should be suspended or fined heavily. Sotheby's will be allowing a lucky bidder the chance to literally own a rare piece of history. One of the only remaining first printings of the U.S. Constitution will be put up for auction. It's just one of 13 surviving copies of its kind and one of two under private ownership. The other privately owned copy sold for $43.2 million last year. Sotheby's placed the estimate on this rare document at $20 to $30 million. The auction takes place December 13th. Welcome back, everyone. Now to the climate crisis. The Mississippi River is at historically low levels. ABC's Ginger Z is taking a look at how the drought could have a big impact on our grocery bills. The mighty Mississippi River. I'm along the Mississippi River bank because it's at a historic low. Is the measly Mississippi. Where I'm standing normally is underwater. Within the last month, at least five river gauges bottoming out to the lowest level since records began as early as the 1890s. A century-old shipwreck near Baton Rouge exposed. Look what I just found. It's a Civil War belt buckle. That's insane. Fossils and relics littering the now dry riverbed. Drought along the entire length of the Mississippi with parched riverbed from Wisconsin to Tennessee. Thousands of people flocking to Tower Rock in Missouri by foot. The historic low levels on the Mississippi River coming at the absolute worst time for farmers. The heart of harvest. See that huge pile of soybeans behind me? It was supposed to make it downriver three weeks ago. 
The Mississippi is the main route for America's breadbasket to the world, responsible for 400 billion in industry and 1.3 million jobs. This is the backbone of America. We move all of our products up and down this river. It's the product that feeds the world, builds the world, and powers the world. Jonathan Dunn works for one of the nation's largest barge operators. Normally we would be running about 46 to 40 barges on our large horsepower boats and now we're running 25 barges on those on those boats. So, so there is a drastic reduction. When the price to ship goes up, the value of the goods go down. The prices drop pretty drastically due to increased freight on the river. So that's got to show up in prices somewhere for yes, it, us? Uh, I think eventually it will. It's, uh, you know, it's going to trickle down to everyone. Now, there's a reason that America still uses barges to transport everything from the soybeans that you see being put in the barge behind me to corn, oil, fertilizer, you name it. We do it because this is cheaper. One barge can hold the same amount as 16 train cars and 70 semi trucks. And on one gallon of gas, the barge can move five times farther than a truck. How much do we need? We need months uh, of you know, normal rainfall to recharge the soil and the river systems. Our thanks to Ginger Z. As high inflation as many Americans tweaking their holiday spending, retailers are trying to entice shoppers to buy early and spread out potentially painful payments over multiple paychecks. But are they the rock bottom lowest prices? Should you buy now or wait? ABC's Becky Worley investigates. Where can you go for the latest must-haves? Halloween is barely in the rearview mirror, but the holiday sales barrage has already begun. Early holiday deals at Amazon. We're really seeing things start earlier than ever before. Amazon, Walmart, and Target starting major sales campaigns in October. And now from Best Buy, their Black Friday deals right now, promoting the Roku streaming stick at $24, while it normally retails around $50. Or the Black Friday preview from Land's End, with these cashmere line tech gloves up to 60% off. Target is rolling out its deals of the day in an effort to get shoppers' attention, too. Today, 25% off any one toy. And Amazon has a myriad of discounts, like these electric toothbrushes, over 25% off. And some beauty items, like this hair straight iron that's 55% off. But experts say don't assume the lowest prices are here now. The first and most important thing to remember is that not every sale is, is going to be a good one. There are a lot of sales out there that are framed as being great discounts that are not, in fact, fantastic. But there are some strategies to find the rock bottom price. Set a price drop alert using shopping apps like Honey or Camel 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 to tell you when prices go down. Those same sites can show you historical pricing data, which may give you an idea of how much lower the price could go on Black Friday. And know that the days around Black Friday will probably still net the best prices on electronics. But if you do buy now, ask if the store has a price protection policy. And what those allow you to do is if you purchase an item and the price falls uh, within a certain window, it allows you to go back to them and be refunded the difference. Helpful tips as always. Our thanks to Becky Worley. He's revered as one of the greatest voices and musicians of all time. While Louis Armstrong's unmistakable talents put him on the world stage, a new documentary is revealing more about the man behind the music. Do you think you've lost by being born black in a white country? No, I don't look at it that way. Old empty bed. Jazz almost stems from Louis Armstrong. Wish I was dead. Anybody who has uttered a sound on American He's radio. So it's because of Louis Armstrong's innovations. Louis Armstrong's Black and Blues is told by those who knew him and his music best, including Armstrong himself. Director Sasha Jenkins joins us now to talk about the film. The documentary has Louis Armstrong tell his own story through scrap diaries. How was it to actually construct this film using his voice, his words? I mean, I tell people all the time, it's like he was the co-director. He left all these breadcrumbs behind. I mean, to hear directly from the man himself, it couldn't get any better than that. So his presence is very strong and very strong in the film because he left back, he left behind so much material, so much rich material. What did you know about Louis Armstrong before you even started this project? As a kid growing up in Queens, I knew that he lived in Queens. I knew there was a local school named after him. I knew all the hits, but that's pretty much it. I didn't know much else beyond it that. 
And you have described him as somebody who was often misunderstood. Yes. What would you say, what do you expect might be revelatory then for viewers? Well, I think um, a lot of black folks didn't think he was uh, had a consciousness or was conscious of what was happening with civil rights and the struggles. And obviously, being born in 1901 in the South, uh, he knew a thing or two about racism and Jim Crow. But uh, he, he has way more of a consciousness than people uh, ever knew. And I think they're going to learn that in the film. What was most surprising to you about him? He's a Renaissance man. I mean, he's a fine artist. He's a great writer, a uh, musician, a singer. He did so many things at such a high level. I can't name anyone in the modern era who has as many talents as Louis Armstrong. How did you decide to choose the rapper Nas uh, to voice this? Well, he and I are from Queens, uh, same part of Queens, went to school together, we're friends. And when I told him I was working on this film, he said, did you know that Wonderful World is my favorite song in the entire world? Wow. So I knew then that he had a new voice. much Would you say that it's a, a fair description to say that this is more about the man, less about the musician? Well, you know, there is, you know, I was a music journalist for many years, and there is some musicology in the film, but my philosophy is in order to understand music, you have to understand the people behind the music, especially with black music in America. And so I think the only real way to unlock all of his musical genius is to understand the man himself. So we set out to make a pretty accurate portrait of who he was and how he felt, and that's what we did. What do you hope uh, that the viewers will, will take away from this? I hope the viewers take away from this film that Mr. Armstrong was a real patriot. You think about the Star Spangled Banner. You know, Jimi Hendrix was criticized for playing it in a particular way during Woodstock. Well. Uh, Armstrong was playing it in a very particular way 20, 30 years before, and it was a reflection of how he felt as an American. It doesn't make him any less American. He said he played that song with great pride always, regardless of the way America felt about him or people like him, he still had great pride in being an American, and I think that's a great message for people of all generations. Have you gained a larger appreciation now for his music? I, again, I think, I don't think anyone is as talented, multifaceted as he, but as a musician, what he's innovated is popular music would not be popular music if Armstrong hadn't done what he did in the way that he sang songs and played his music. Popular music would not be what it is today without Louis Armstrong. We'll leave it right there. Sasha, we thank you so much thank for coming you. on the show. Really appreciate that. Louis Armstrong's Black and Blues is now streaming on Apple TV+. And before we go tonight, the image of the day, it is All Souls Day in Bangladesh. Christian devotees lit candles by their relatives' graves. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Hour, we're staying on top of a few things. A major settlement why CVS and Walgreens have agreed to pay a $10 billion payout. Threats to walk off the job from pilots with major airlines just weeks before the holiday travel season begins. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
from the giant sequoias to the waterfalls. It's an amazing place. But in Yosemite, criminals go on vacation too. The park ranger found partial human remains. That was a human hand. That opened the possibility of suspects. Henry Lee Lucas. Carrie Stainer. Donald Gibson. Any of them could have done it. We're gonna figure this thing out. Wild Crime, season two, Murder in Yosemite. Now streaming only on Hulu. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Hey everyone, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. CBS Health and Walgreens have agreed in principle to pay about $10 billion in total to settle a series of opioid-related lawsuits brought against the pharmacy chains. Despite the big payout, CBS was clear that the settlement is not, quote, an admission of any liability or wrongdoing. U.S. gymnastics fans can now officially book their trips to the Paris Olympics. The U.S. women's gymnastics team won gold at the 2022 Artistic Gymnastics World Championship championships in Liverpool, England, securing their ticket to the 2024 Summer Olympic Games in Paris. It's the national team's sixth consecutive win since 2011. And America could have a new billionaire by tomorrow, and maybe, just maybe, it'll be you. Probably won't, but it's always nice to dream. Tonight's Powerball drawing is worth $1.2 billion, and it's the second largest in the game's history, the fourth largest lottery jackpot overall. There have been 38 straight Powerball drawings without a grand prize winner. We are, of course, less than a week away from the midterm election, and as voters are now heading to the polls for early voting, President Biden has addressed the nation about the recent rash of politically motivated violence and condemned election deniers. This comes as we are learning from court documents that the suspect told investigators he was on a, quote, suicide mission and had plans to target other California and federal politicians. We also learned Capitol Police had a camera in front of the Pelosi home, but was it being monitored? Our Mo Lange has the latest tonight from San Francisco. Let's go. Tonight, new details about the security surrounding House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's San Francisco home at the time of that brazen attack on her husband, Paul. The U.S. Capitol Police revealing they have cameras surveilling the residents, but they were not being actively monitored because the speaker wasn't there. Sources telling ABC News that Capitol Police only saw the break-in after they noticed the flashing lights from San Francisco Police in the video and rewound the footage. The Pelosi home was also equipped with a private security system, sources say, but it's not clear if the alarm from that system went off. There was no Capitol Police, there was no private security present at the time. This is the San Francisco DA's office reveals chilling new information about the assault. This was a targeted attack. This was not a, a random residential burglary. Writing in a court filing, when David DePap allegedly startled Mr. Pelosi awake, he allegedly had a large hammer in his right hand and several white plastic zip ties in his left hand. Pelosi asking DePap why he wanted to see or talk to Nancy. DePap responding, well, she's number two in line for the presidency, right? And when Pelosi acknowledged the fact that she was, DePap allegedly responding, they are all corrupt and we've got to take them all out, subsequently saying that it was the end of the road for Mr. Pelosi. Pelosi grabbing his phone in the bathroom and calling 911. Moments after officers arrived, DePap allegedly striking Mr. Pelosi in the head at full force with the hammer, which knocked Mr. Pelosi unconscious. Pelosi remaining unresponsive for about three minutes, waking up in a pool of his own blood. Afterward, DePap allegedly saying, I didn't really want to hurt him, but you know this was a suicide mission. I'm not going to stand here and do nothing even if it costs me my life. And naming other targets, including a professor and several prominent state and federal politicians and their relatives. It comes as heated political rhetoric across the country shows no signs of cooling less than a week before the midterms. Homeland Security I Secretary would, uh, Alejandro Mayorkas, one-on-one -on -one with our Pierre Thomas. They were very concerned about the temperature. The, the frequency and gravity of uh, the calls uh, to violence that we are seeing. Such a spike in these politically motivated attacks and threats. Mola Lange joins us now. Mola, you've learned House Democrats are now asking questions of Capitol Police tonight. What kinds of questions? 
That's right, Lindsay. In a letter some lawmakers have written to the Capitol Hill, to the Capitol Police Chief, uh, they are demanding answers about security and protocols, especially for those who are in the direct line of succession uh, to become the president. Meanwhile, the Capitol uh, Police Chief says that they have launched an internal security review, that they are working to beef up protections for members of Congress. The Capitol Police Chief himself has said that they need more resources to help them do their job. Lindsay? Quite a police presence outside of Nancy Pelosi's home tonight. Mola Lange, our thanks to you. Tonight, President Biden among those now sounding the alarm about political violence in the days after the husband of the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, was brutally attacked inside his San Francisco home, what investigators say was politically motivated. In a speech tonight, the president called this a defining moment in our country. Take a listen in part to what he had to say. This institution, this intimidation, this violence against Democrats, Republicans, and nonpartisan officials just doing their jobs are the consequence of lies told for power and profit, lies of conspiracy and malice, lies repeated over and over to generate a cycle of anger, hate, vitriol, and even violence. In this moment, we have to confront those lies with the truth. The very future of our nation depends on it. My fellow Americans, we're facing a defining moment, an inflection point. We must, with one overwhelming, unified voice, speak as a country and say there's no place, no place for voter intimidation or political violence in America, whether it's directed at Democrats or Republicans. No place, period. No place ever. We don't settle our differences in America with a riot, a mob, or a bullet, or a hammer. We settle them peaceably at the battle, at the battle box, the ballot box. President saying democracy is on the ballot. Now to the economy and the latest move by the Federal Reserve to try to slow down inflation. Today, the Fed raised its key interest rate three quarters of a point. That's the sixth increase just this year and increases the cost of borrowing for Americans as the Fed hopes to cool off the economy without sending it into a painful recession. And of course, the economy and inflation are top of mind for voters just days before the critical midterm elections. That's especially true in states like Nevada, which could help determine which party controls the Senate. ABC's Martha Raditz was recently on the ground there speaking to voters and has the very latest. She's the nation's first Latina senator and she's fighting for political survival. So overnight, former President Obama in Nevada rallying with Catherine Cortez Masto, urging supporters not to give up the fight. Tuning out is not an option. Moping and feeling cynical is not an option. Cortez Masto battling low name recognition in a state that's seen large numbers of voters move in and move out. Inflation here now above the national average. Gas prices, the fifth highest in the country. Tourism, the backbone of the economy, grinding to a halt during the pandemic. Cortez Masto now counting on a volunteer army workers from the powerful culinary union going door to door to get out the vote. Her rival, former state attorney general Adam Laxalt, a Trump Republican who spearheaded the former president's efforts to overturn the election results in this state. If he loses this election to me, he's claiming it's stolen. But in the final stretch, Laxalt focusing on the economy saying voters are hurting. They can't believe that Joe Biden and Kathy Cortez Masto have done this much damage to our great country and to our great state in just two short years. And for Nevadans we spoke with, the economy is the number one issue. Inflation, that's a big issue with you, why? Because the prices have gone so high, you know, and, and I live on Social Security. I'm 79. It, it's not keeping up with it. So many in the same boat are thanks to Martha. The shooter behind the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas massacre was officially sentenced to life in prison after hearing two days' worth of victim impact statements. Victims and family members poured their hearts out and did not hold back in telling the mass murderer about the pain that he caused. ABC's Victor Kendo has the details. 
Tonight, face to face with the victims and families, the Parkland shooter sentenced to life. The court imposes a mandatory life sentence without the possibility of parole. Nicholas Cruz sentenced to 17 consecutive life terms for the students and staff he killed and 17 additional life terms for the attempted murders of those he wounded. I am ordering that all 34 counts of the indictment for each sentence is to run consecutive, that is one after another. For the second day, families of the victims unleash their anger at the shooter. Many frustrated the jury did not agree on the death penalty. The fact that I have to share my world with you is disgusting. Many wishing him a painful experience and death in prison. You, on the other hand, will remain in a cage like the creature you are. I only pray that you get to rot in that cage and that you are punished each day 17 times over for the 17 you murdered. The mother of 14-year-old Jamie Guttenberg addressing Cruz, telling him he shouldn't be hiding behind a mask. It's disrespectful to be hiding your expressions under your mask when we as the families are sitting here talking to you. Cruz then removing his mask. Jamie's father also speaking, going through the moments he and so many other families will never experience. By a show of hands, anyone else in this room because of him going to have to endure not watching people they love get married? Painful to watch that. Our thanks to Victor. Now to the war in Ukraine. Ukrainian forces have been closing in on the strategic city of Kherson to the south. ABC's foreign correspondent James Longman was there with the forces and filed this report. The battle for Kherson is intensifying. Ukrainians today claiming hits on this bridge in the southern city. This is the road to Kherson. It's the biggest city that Russia has in its control in this whole country and it's the only regional capital and the guys here were saying that just a few weeks ago this was the very front line of their fight with the Russians but now they've managed to push them back. They're now closing in on the city hoping to deal Putin a humiliating blow but it's taken its toll. For the people fighting here it's meant months months without seeing their families. We're far away from our homes he says but we're close to the homes of those people who we helped return. It's our people. Mm -hmm. It's your people. It's our country. They're advancing here with US-provided heavy weapons. Yeah, we're hearing more and more activity now all around us. It's just, it's constant. Going out, going out, going out, and some of it coming back. I think we should move. And technology is making the difference. The Ukrainians have gone digital. He has this device here, and with help from the United States and others, you can use satellites now to get the coordinates, and they can aim and fire much more quickly. With the sound of war all around him, Leonid smiles from his front porch, battered just last night by a shell that landed on his neighbor's house. I mean, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Seven months of this war, and yet, basically, everywhere you go in Ukraine, you, you meet people like Leonid who say, well, I'm not leaving. Yeah. This is my home, he says. This is my place. I will not give it to anyone. So many share that sentiment. Our thanks to James. Thanksgiving now just weeks away, and pilots at two of the biggest airlines are threatening to walk off the job, leaving many wondering how this could impact holiday travel. ABC's Gio Benitez has the story. With holiday travel just weeks away, pilots at some of the biggest airlines voicing frustration. United Pilots announcing they'll start picketing soon, and at Delta, nearly all of them voting to authorize a strike. We've worked uh, incredibly hard throughout the pandemic to get our customers safely to their destinations. We continue to work hard to this day. We will continue working hard, uh, but we're ready and willing to strike. Pilots say they're frustrated with their pay and benefits as they put in long hours working record overtime. We are uh, continuing to uh, work longer days. We're spending more time away from our family. And the ball is in the company's court. Delta telling ABC News, we are confident that the parties will reach an agreement that is fair and equitable, vowing this won't affect operations. And overnight, United Pilots rejecting a tentative agreement saying pilots will begin informational picketing immediately. What the Delta pilot strike vote is, is a shot across the bow. And I think that Delta management understands the gravity of this and is serious about 
trying to find uh, an arrangement. Experts say this could be the biggest holiday travel rush since the pandemic, possibly even surpassing pre-pandemic levels. It comes after a record-breaking summer travel season full of chaos. With a slew of weather issues and pilot shortages, passengers were met with thousands of delays and cancellations, luggage even piling up at airports. Now, as the number of people screened at airports averages more than 2 million per day, airlines are hiring and training thousands of new employees, hoping for smoother holiday travel. The weather is the big unknown. Uh, Mother Nature uh, can either be gracious to us or can be mean. Let's hope she's gracious. Fingers crossed. Our thanks to Gio for that. Pediatric units in hospitals across the country are strained because of the triple-demic of viruses sickening children. Hospitalizations for RSV are already higher than at their peak last year. Most patients are children. ABC's Ariel Reshef went inside the pediatric ICU at Cohen's Children's Medical Center on Long Island and has the very latest. On the front lines in the fight against the country's surge in respiratory viruses, doctors are treating a relentless flow of young patients. Today literally is probably one of the busiest days I've seen in my career. The ICU at New York's Cohen Children's Medical Center has been over capacity for weeks. We're giving a lot of support that often requires inhalation therapies, sometimes steroids, sometimes breathing machines like ventilators until the virus itself works its way out. Three-year-old Ella Guillem is on a ventilator battling RSV and rhinovirus. Her mom, Anita, saw the warning signs. I mean, when you start to see your child struggling, and become so lethargic, your intuition knows that there's something wrong. Hospitals across the country strained. Pediatric beds in 17 states are above 80% capacity. Orange County, California declaring a health emergency. And in Michigan, one hospital reporting that RSV cases went from 95 to 833 in a month. I love you so much, mommy. Okay. I'm right here. Doctors say the vast majority of kids won't be hospitalized with RSV, but some, like Ella, need help until their immune systems can beat the virus. How are you coping with this? I'm trying to keep high spirit for her, but I obviously have times when I break down, but obviously it's, it's tough to see. Nobody wants to see their kid in this situation. No one does. Our thanks to Ariel. Still to come, celebrations across the Americas, the traditions behind the colorful remembrances of lost friends and family. We're all familiar with Sesame Street, but there's a version that you likely have not seen. Author Natasha Lance Rogoff tells us about the unexpected challenges that she experienced when working to adapt the beloved children's show for a Russian audience. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers in Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hi, <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. 
Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. The Ethiopian government and regional forces from Tigray agreed to cease hostilities, marking a diplomatic breakthrough two years into a war that has killed thousands, displaced millions, and left hundreds of thousands facing famine. Just over a week after formal peace talks mediated by the African Union began in South Africa, delegates from both sides signed an agreement described by an official as a permanent cessation of hostilities. Despite the progress, the agreement does not address the deeper political tensions that contributed to the conflict. Hundreds of people marched in Sri Lanka's largest city of Colombo protesting against higher taxes, inflation, and alleged state-led repression as the country struggles to emerge from its worst financial crisis in seven decades. Sri Lanka has been gripped by a deep financial crisis this year that has left the island of 22 million struggling to pay for essential imports, including fuel, food, fuel, cooking gas, and medicine. Celebrations for Day of the Dead spanned across the Americas. Faithfuls across Bolivia celebrated with bread shaped like children, which represents the deceased. In Guatemala, giant kites made out of paper with beautiful designs soared through the skies outside of cemeteries, a tradition that dates back more than a century ago. And in Mexico, families held vigils and decorated the graves of their dead loved ones with flowers, candles, colorfully cut paper, food, and beverages. The beloved children's television program Sesame Street is a show so many of us grew up watching in the U.S., but it's also watched internationally in more than 30 countries. But imagine trying to start a new version of the program in Russia in the 1990s after the fall of the Soviet Union. Natasha Lance Rogoff's new book, Muppets in Moscow, the unexpected crazy true story of making Sesame Street in Russia, tells the story of how she and a team work to adapt Sesame Street for a Russian audience. Natasha, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So talk to us about Ulitsa Sezam, right? You were living in Russia for several years there, working as a journalist and documentarian, not necessarily planning on children's content. So how did this idea come about? The, uh, it was an absolutely remarkable project and very ambitious. Um, it's, we, um, I was approached by Sesame Street's executives at the time, and, uh, and the idea was that the Muppets would be the best ambassadors to bring idealistic values to post-communist Russia. But the idea really intrigued me, and, um, you know, the, the prospect of working with hundreds of artists puppeteers, musicians, uh, writers. This was an exciting time. There was so much hope. And, you know, I thought that, that Sesame Street could really help in terms of modeling uh, different values and skills that children would need to thrive in a new open society. And, and you've talked about the challenge that it wasn't the same. You couldn't just bring the characters and the music and the metaphors. So how did you go about making sure that it fit appropriately in Russia? Well, Sesame Street has international co-productions around the world. And in the case of Russia, uh, you know, one of the first steps is to assemble a group of uh, child education experts to determine the educational content of the show. And each show in every different country reflects the culture and values of that society. And that extends to the Muppets themselves. So that in the case of Russia, you know, our uh, essentially Big Bird, who was an eight foot hound-like blue furry character with leaves and moss uh, all over his costume, came from a, uh, a character out of Russian folklore called Domovoy, which is the spirit of the home and nature. Very Russian. <laughs> <laughs> but the children's um, values, is that the same at its core from country to country when we talk about the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do. I mean, are there certain things that you could just instill in an attempt to I inspire and enlighten young kids? No, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question, and one would think so. But, you know, when it's a society like Russia, where it's coming out of 70 years of communism and a completely different ideology, a completely different economic system, 
it was it would be um, naive to expect that um, you could simply transplant the American show with American values into that society. They have a different history than we did. You know, but when we when we talk about the values, you know, an example of that is uh, we were all trying to come up with, you know, what what should just the show teach children? And I, you know, raised my hand and said, well, what about um, having a scenario where they show children running a lemonade stand? You know, they would learn counting and team building skills. I thought that was pretty innocent. And that was met with complete horror where the educators responded that that would be shameful to show children selling things on the street. Oh my goodness. Because under communism, the people who would be illegally selling items on the street for profit under communism would be criminals and the mm. mafia. I mean, it was a very intense period, not only in Russia, but for us, for our team, trying to be sensitive to oh. help, you know, as much as we could create a show that reflected their society, but also would promote values which would help them move a transition towards an open society. Considering all that has happened now with Russia invading Ukraine, I want to get to a quote uh, that you concluded in your book, a colleague of yours wrote to you saying, I have only one hope that the generations of children who grew up on Ulitsa Sezam will find a way to create harmony in our country again and end this madness. Do you think that that's still possible? I do. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, um, I saw change in my lifetime. I lived in Russia in the 1980s as a student and then as a journalist. I made films and I watched the Soviet Union collapse. That changed in my lifetime. And in addition to that, um, I am aware now that the people who are the 20-year-olds, late 20s and the 30-year-olds, who are now marching out of Russia because they don't want to fight. Mm -hmm. That is, that's the Sesame Street generation. That's the Ulitsa Sazam generation. They all grew up loving Zeliboba. And on the Ukrainian side, same thing. That's the 20-year-olds, the, the same age cohort that are defending their freedom and independence that they got and built during the period of creating Ulitsa Sazam, those adults now also grew up on the show. Really fascinating stuff, Natasha. We thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, and we will also want to let our viewers know her book, Muppets in Moscow, The Unexpected Crazy True Story of Making Sesame Street in Russia, is now available wherever books are sold. And still to come, the mail carrier who also saved someone's life. News and daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. 
Finally tonight, a Hendersonville, North Carolina mail carrier has been delivering letters and bills to the community for more than six years, getting to know and care for the people who rely on them. While they can always count on him to deliver, the other day he really came through in a life-saving way. Reporter Samir Nafsi from our partner station WLOS shows us how in our local lowdown. As a mail carrier, I feel like that our relationship is, is strong with the people in the community and they rely on me for things and obviously me being here was the difference in him living and dying possibly. It's a common sight to see Smith donning his satchel and going door to door on North Whittet Street, often forming relationships and stopping by to chat with residents along the way. It's kind of a weird bond because you're not family and you're, they're almost, they're sort of strangers, but it's a very friendly, very friendly bond. After noticing a growing pile of untouched mail and a vehicle that hadn't been driven, he knew something was wrong. Some people that's normal, but for Mr. Jones, it's a little abnormal because I see him almost once a week. After an unanswered door knock, Smith called the Hendersonville Police Department, a decision that may have saved the man's life. We found the elderly male laying on the floor. It appeared as though he'd been laying there a while um, and he needed medical attention. Police aren't releasing the man's identity until they can talk with his family, but we have learned he's in his 80s and was taken to Pardee Hospital. The news shocking the tight-knit community. He was a real positive influence in our community. While the community waits for an update on his condition, his mailman is looking forward to seeing him again. Well, as soon as I see him, I might give him a hug. Imagine he will do just that. Thanks so much for watching. That's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change.